Hi, everybody. This is Chris Phillips, the founder of Socrates Cafe. Uh, SocratesCafe.com is our website. And uh, this is our is our video cast. And today mm -hmm. I am beyond honored to have as my guests, our longtime advisory board member, most prominent, provocative in the best sense, public intellectual and philosopher. Scholarly, everything he says is a dissertation. He endlessly fascinates me, Dr. Cornell West, who, can I give a plug for myself, wrote the beautiful forward to my new book, Soul of Goodness. Uh, oh my gosh, the forward's better than the book. I got it. No, no, that's not true. Oh, <laughs> that's a and, his, and his beloved wife, uh, uh, Anahita Madavi West, who wrote the most stirring moving essay about the crisis in Iran that it's really uh, uh, Ana, Dr. Anahita Madavi West, you, you, this brings in a way all the way back to 1979, what is happening right now with Masa Amini. Uh, she was 22 years old when she was taken into custody on September 13th and apparently died on or around September 16th. Uh, that led to yet another uprising, this time a track of, of because she had a loose hijab. And she was in in uh, Tehran, the principal city. And so she was uh, she's of Kurdish ethnicity and was taken into custody and and was likely killed, beaten and, and killed and has led to a great uprising part of which emanated in this extraordinary essay that you wrote that just moved me to the core and that Brother West also shared on social media. And I just first of all want to start out by saying, um, what can we do? What can any of us in anywhere around the world do without trying to piggyback our own causes and ideologies onto this, which happens tragically much too often to to be part of a movement that is increasingly, even in Iran, from what I'm reading, bringing people who are t from somewhat more conservative leanings in the country. What can we do as a, as a people, as human beings, right here, right now? Um, well, I, I would like to start by thanking you for uh, inviting us, you know, giving us this platform. Um, thank you for uh, acknowledging the estate. The question is a question that to be honest with you, I ask myself as someone in an Iranian in diaspora, what can we do? So in order to answer that question, I try to listen to people in Iran, um, you know, talking to them, asking them. And um, I think the best that we can do is to create platforms like this, to not to let this uh, be the yesterday's news um, to constantly talk about it, write about it, um, uh, post as many videos as we can, uh, because you know that the internet is caught in Iran. It gets, it's getting better, but whatever videos that come from Iran, whatever news that comes from Iran, uh, if the news outlets, podcasts, all kind of medias on social media or mainstream media, to keep talking about it, writing about it, um, so that the atrocities are being shown and viewed for the world. I think that's what we can do here um, to not to let this uprising um, be hidden because that's what the regime wants to do. Brother Wes, you've been talking about the dying of democracy everywhere. In fact, you gave a talk on that theme, I believe at the University of California, Irvine, where preceding this, you, you, your subtitle was uh, U.S., Iran, and the Middle East, you actually singled out, teased out Iran from that. This has been preying on your mind and heart for quite some time. How do you, how do you relate this? Yeah, that, that, you know, for me, it's a matter of trying to be morally consistent and spiritually sound so that we accent the plight of all peoples, no matter where they are, who are wrestling with forms of repression wrestling with forms of oppression. Bonhoeffer used to say, we have no right 
to Gregorian chants without hearing the cry of Jews. That was the 1930s. You would say the same thing about that in America, the 1960s and now with poor people and black people, indigenous people and brown people. Same would be true in Mexico, dealing with the peasants and various forms of oppression. Same is true in Iran, same is true wherever where we're talking, it could be the West Bank of Gaza. Part of our problem in the diaspora though, is we have so many people who will raise their voices on one set of cries and not raise their voices on the cries across the board, no matter who they are, given the kinds of oppression that precious human beings are wrestling with. And that's what we see with the young sisters in Iran and the whole nation now. Right? So that's why when, when I read the Anahita's piece, it just hit me so hard. It, was so it hit common. me too. So I, I keep looking at so, it again and again, quite honestly. And you know, exactly. one of the reasons is, Anahita, is because it goes from the deeply intimate and personal. You talk about your family, um, the, the smells, the colors, the scarves, uh, a matter that it was a choice. Um, and I think one of the reasons it, it hits me is because, I don't know if you know this, I have dual citizenship from Greece. And my, my Greek grandmother, my yaya, came to the U.S., uh, when it was taken over by the fascists, her island, by Mussolini's minions. And so she came to the U.S. and was actually maltreated by the KKK because they were swarthy. Um, there were poor Southern Greeks. Congress passed a law in 1923 prohibiting any further poor Southern Greeks from immigrating. How you doing? How you doing? And, now, and now, ladies and gentlemen, I have my own special guest. Hello. Hi. It's my so nice wife, Sassy. Nice to meet you, too. Yeah. Sassy, we're giving you a hug. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> back, back, back. <laughs> so on May 11th, we celebrate 25 years of marriage. And on oh, and uh, now we, she's put up with me for over 27 years as a couple. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you, it's no small feat. <laughs> That first encounter right there at Socrates Cafe. Oh, he really the only one who showed up. The only one who showed up. <laughs> he, he's, he's amazing. Um, how do you remember yeah. that? Um, yeah, yeah. So you get to see me after I've had a couple cups of coffee. She gets to see me uh, before. <laughs> <laughs> she sees the Dr. Jekyll. You oh, both look wonderful. Yes, magnificent. Yes, <laughs> so how so i feel this um she's the kkk uh vilified my family my my family when they came from they lived in hopewell virginia which was a poorish southern um city in virginia and so so anahita i really related to what to what you were writing yeah. but i i i wanna you know i i got my citizenship in greece to feel from a tiny island called nisiros in the south aegean population to this day less than a thousand but there's still this this oppressiveness you come to places not just for better economic hope but you miss terribly the land that you came from mm -hmm. you know and and she didn't want to come to the u.s she had to they were yeah. so poor and and it, when i read about your story when you left in 1985 you lived in turkey i can see turkey from nisiros um, I mean, what was that like to live in as a as a refugee like that? And then, you know, to your, your life has been on the ascent, but you must miss home terribly in all the senses. Yes. Yeah, so um, thank you again for your acknowledgement about the essay. I think what I was trying to do was to show also the side of the humanity of Iranian people and the um, not just what you see on the news, uh, which is so much trauma, but all these people go back home and you know go back to their moms and dads and grandmothers. And there is so much love and family love and relations. And uh, so as a, um, as a refugee, you know, looking at all of these videos are pretty much re-traumatizing because I've lived during war in Iran. I've lived during the revolution in Iran, but the sense of being in exile is, I don't know how to put it in words uh, in a few minutes. I think that could be another 100 pages of an essay, but you definitely have your foot in two, three, four, five different worlds. It's like living in a multi-dimensional universe. Uh, 
you know, till this day when people ask me, and usually that's a very first question you get when you speak with an accent is, where are you from? And I have to literally pause and think about where am I from? Do they think, are, you, are they asking me about Iran? Is it, is it uh, Los Angeles? Is it New York? Is it, so there's always that, um, you know, quest for identity as an immigrant or, or refugee and absolutely missing your, your homeland, missing your families. Now I was, uh, in a way blessed to have my immediate family outside of Iran. My uh, parents, my father passed away in 2015, but my parents and my older sister, my brother, they all lived in Sweden. We all were living in Sweden. From Turkey, I went to Sweden, then I came to America. So I could have, you know, I have been able uh, to go and visit them, um, but I don't know if they were, if they were in Iran, would I, able to visit them or not. So I haven't been back since 1985 and I have absolutely, um, you know, a lot of families there, cousins, aunts, uncles, so some certain belongings, but it's fascinating how brain works because in my memories, everything is so fresh. You know, what I remember of Iran is 1985. Mm. When I look at my cousins, I have to pause and you know, the, the, you know, I, I, in, my, in my head, the image is, is that 25 year old cousin. And when I talk to them, you know, I have to add these 40 some years. It's, it's, it's really fascinating how your reality and what you think or your memories are very, um, you know, they contradict each other. And then you look at these videos, you look at this um, constant uprisings in the past 40 years, there have been many. And uh, that's why I wanted to, my essay to have this point of, this is not something new. It has been even from 1979, post-revolution, immediately after revolution, women were in the streets asking for their rights. Yes, and you've been writing about and speaking about the resiliency and what your doctoral dissertation about the resiliency of, of immigrants, uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, this has been, and you also wrote a beautiful essay called, I think around six years ago, about women empower themselves. So this has been, women can empower themselves. So this is actually, you. your writings have preceded this and yet emanate from it at the same time. This has been something that's been, been preying on your mind and heart for a very long time. Absolutely. You know, I've lived with a you know, with an uh, Iranian woman as my mother, seeing her resiliency, whether inside of Iran or outside of Iran, my aunts. Uh, so yes, the resiliency is an adaptability of uh, Iranian people and many other uh, members of community, uh, minority communities is, is astonishing. They, um, so it has, it has been very close to my heart. I uh, have, uh, worked with refugees for a long time in, in, the, um, in the role of a clinician. Um, refugees from Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, and other, obviously, other regions. But yes, the resiliency is within the personal lives, in the society, to adapt, to learn languages, to find a new culture, acculturate, it's all um, a projection of who they are, and we can see them right now mm -hmm. in Iran, you know, getting, uh, rising up against a tyranny. And they, every time they go in the streets, there is a possibility of not coming back. But it is at the same time that very much uh, impressive their courage. At the same time, it's very sad because they go, they say, we have nothing to lose but our lives. It's extraordinary. It's almost inconceivable for me, as much as I try to think about it, to imagine that level of courage, to know that you might, a sister, a mother, a grandmother, go out on the street to join a protest, you might be indiscriminately slaughtered, not come home. And people are doing it now. It, it's, it's, I don't know, I can't even find the words for it. Brother West, you've been talking about when, when uh, I earned my PhD at 50, 
And the first thing I did, I got a fellowship at Penn and I used Brother West's Democracy Matters book as my principal text and his Race Matters as another text. And ever since he's poor guy hasn't been able to beat me off with a stick. He thought this I, is a one-off deal. I'll come see brother Phyllis for a day. I'd love to see my brother Chris. Okay. I was like, here we are 10 years later. <laughs> but, but the point of his book is that there's competing strains. There's the fast-paced capitalism, which is basically sociopathic. And there's the tradition of Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, and there's manifestations of it, like what's happening right now, with the uprising in Iran. And how do we, we can't reconcile that. What do we do, Brother West, uh, to have that, uh, you know, your colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Sachs said, look, we also have to, yes, we do need to stand up for the downtrodden abroad, but let's look at what's going on in our own house. Uh, there's so many things we've lost women. It's back to the Neanderthal times in the US. There's more rights to abortion in Latin America that right now than in most parts of the U.S. It's chilling. What? What? How do we reconcile all this when we're actually taking steps back? Women are losing the right to abortion. Uh, people are heedless about extreme climate change and those impacts on drought and famine. And I, I, I I'm having trouble here. <laughs> well, brother, I think we, we do very much what you and. So successfully been doing all this time, which is raise your voice, unleashing Socratic energy, pressing the questions in a gentle but strong way, and then trying to be prophetic, allow the love, not just of truth, beauty, and the abstract, but of people. When, when, when Anahita talks about her mother with a gym and a Jew, she unleashes the love. She's a love boy. Her father was one of the great revolutionary poets and revolutionary oh yes he's in the tradition of Hafez and Rumi and company and he just got she's got a collection of poems coming out actually fairly soon. oh my god it's, it's the lifting of voice which as you know is the anthem of black folk it's so but it's trying to accent the best of who we are we think of persians and greeks and italians and mexicans and jews and black people those are great people at their best now, all of them got gangsters, too. All of them got thugs, too. But at their best, is nothing like it. Nothing like the best of who we are. Now, how do we undo that? Well, that's what you all do at the cafes. Mm -hmm. That's what we try to do in our classrooms. That's what we try to do when we hit the streets. You're talking about your beloved wife going to jail in Mexico. You see all that love flowing out of her. And that love taking the form of justice-seeking. And why? because these brothers and sisters catching hell in Mexico have exactly the same value and significance as those sisters in Iran, as working people in Ethiopia, right now dealing with the civil strike, as those brothers and sisters, wherever they are. Mm -hmm. Anahita, you were talking about social media and how we can use it to create awareness. And I think, um, I think we need to talk, you know, to to explore ourselves, our place in the world and see beyond religions, beyond race, beyond anything and just see our humanity and what connects us. I think until we have that awareness and our place in the world, which is not superior to any other living being or non living being, um, I think um, I think that's to me is more about how are we educating you know which um how are we educating our young to become aware of themselves and everything around them so that we can become better as a species <laughs> absolutely i could not agree more um i uh, really love what you said that it's about the humanity as a whole so I cannot be selective in my um, social justice or freedom fighting dynamics and say, here is my voice only for Iran. And then if you know someone says, here's my voice only for uh, Ukraine, for example, I cannot live in America and not be vocal about uh, the atrocities that are happening in America against black people, indigenous people, all these, uh, you know, the brutalities, um, 
So I absolutely agree with you. Once you have that lens that looks at the world and looks at all the injustices everywhere, mm -hmm. um, then we connect to each other's humanity. I am standing in solidarity with my sisters and brothers in Iran as I am standing in solidarity with my uh, sisters and brothers uh, of indigenous descent of black people or any other community that is under uh, scrutiny. And that's what uh, I think that what you talk about awareness, that's how we can um, pro promote this awareness that unless we do, we stand for each other, no matter what color, what ethnicity, where in the world, this is not going to get resolved. Right. So I, I completely agree with you. Mm -hmm. You know, in Mexico, there's record rates of femicide. They're yes. so yes. they, they whenever women come out and protest in mass, they put barriers around their monuments, the mm -hmm. so-called leftist progressive mm -hmm. president. Instead of I want these barriers around women, mm -hmm. you know, I want them protected. Uh, the, the racism, the virulent racism mm -hmm. against indigenous people or brown skinned mm -hmm. people something people don't tend to talk about here we we actually have produced our children's book day of why in my oh, language wow. and wow. anahita i don't know if you know this but our our uh, philosophers club book which was the first philosophical book it's published in kurdish wow. yeah and wow. and i and i actually wonder is the fact that that she was kurdish of kurdish descent did that contribute to her, her violent treatment. Which... Well, you know that I think we all know that Kurdish people have the longest history in courage, uh, freedom fighters. Um, in Iran, Kurdish people have been amongst the frontliners to fight for freedom and against oppression. Since I was a child, I would hear about them and my dad would talk about the Kurdish people. I think that's well known whether Kurdish people are um, you know, you know, Iranian courts or Iraqi courts or Syrians or Turkish. We know that about this um, community. And I think a lot of things ha definitely have added to, um, you know, sister, beloved sister Masa Amini's death uh, or killing, and obviously being of Kurdish descent, how innocently, I mean, all of these people that were killed, killed, were killed innocently. But it was also, uh, a fuel to that fire that has been burning for 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, people were up to here. It was, they were fed up. And this time they, you know, they came to the streets and said, that's it, can't take our lives too. One of the slogans are, we fight, we die, but we will free Iran. So they know that this fight can result in dying, but it has been 40 years, 40 years of power and control over women first, and then all the other atrocities that comes. Being gay in Iran is a crime that can kill you. You can get persecuted and prosecuted if you're gay, um, if you don't wear your hijab in a certain way, if you criticize the government, and you know, not to mention the poverty levels, not to mention the child labor. You know, there are pictures that come from Iran that are these five-year-olds, six-year-olds in the winter that are selling gum or selling candy. Uh, it's just, so this is a fight of people that have, that are fed up for 40 years of oppression, political oppression, economic oppression, cultural, all their rights taken away. And so killing of Masa Amini was the, the fuel that fed that fire that was always burning. Mm. Do you do you envision a time when you both can go to Iran? I I think I instead of envisioning it, I would say it's a wish. Mm -hmm. Sometimes wishes don't come true, mm -hmm. but I think I there is a wish that maybe one day. But before that, you know, I because that would be about me and my personal wishes. But before that. I want to, you know, I'm envisioning a free Iran, a democratic Iran, a, an Iran that is, um, that people are able to cast their vote for who they think is um, uh, the person or persons that can run the country in a democratic way. I want to envision an Iran that is 
uh, free of these mass killings day by day, uh, envision an Iran that doesn't have so many political prisoners in their notorious uh, jails and prisons. Um, and once that happened, I probably would, mm. probably next step would be to envision how can we maybe make our, our way to Iran. Mm. I know people in Iran love Cornell. Um, mm. So I'm sure they will greet him uh, with love. <laughs> well, you remember the great Stephen Sondheim says in Act Two of Into the Woods, dreams come true but not free. You All got right. the fight. You got I'm coming back fight. at you with the song then. <laughs> so, my concern the New York Times Brother West just came out with a poll that said most American voters are more concerned about economic issues than they are about the dying <laughs> of democracy. democracy. Yes, right. So, on the one hand, we got the OJs for the love of money. People will <laughs> steal from their mother, rob from their brother. Oh, you so right. All about the scratch. And then on the other side, we got Sly and the Family Stone, where we're trying to create a world in which everybody is a star. Yes. So yes. Love it. Do at a time love when people are more concerned about money than democracy. Well, that's we not that's not new, my brother. That's not new. That's how fascism and authoritarianism, they're able to survive all around the world. People concerned about their immediate safety and security and not their long-term quality of how they relate to others and how others can pursue lives of decency and dignity. But those same old Jays who sang for love of money, sang the love train, staying on that love train, brother, indeed, indeed, indeed. <laughs> I'm mm. I'm I'm worried. I have a nine-year-old and a sixteen-year-old. Oh, precious, precious! Both of them so precious. Both girls. But yeah. I'm worried about the world that we're bringing in, and I do connect it to what's yeah. happening. The the pernicious sense of the lack of sense of there before the grace of God go on. The lack of empathy, mm -hmm. and and I'm wor and I'm wondering what's the end game? Where's Iran going to be in three years, five years, ten years? Um, where are we going to be? I, I don't know the answers, but I just wonder what what do you foresee? What are your hopes and dreams and visions for Iran uh, and and connecting it to American empathy and, and involvement and courage? I think as far as the world in being in such a dark place, um, I feel like it has always been a dark place. You know, I have been in a, in a, you know, there was a time that I thought, will I survive the next day when there are bombings in, in a city that you live? Um, so I, I have a 20, I mean, together we have three beautiful beloved children, they're young. So we think about their future as well. Um, I shouldn't say together, but I should between him, him and I. Well, we got three wonderful ones. I have <laughs> yeah, no doubt about true, yeah. that, you and I. Yeah. History so, yeah. So, um, <laughs> I think uh, hmm. our children is always live your life, be the best human being you can be, be kind, take every minute, um, and tomorrow is in the hands of God. Because mm. I have been there when I didn't know if there's tomorrow or not. And mm. then there, here, here we are 40 years later. Um, so I think what I envision for Iran is what I also already said that it's, mm. it's a democratic Iran. I don't know if there's anywhere or ever going to be 100% democracy, but at least a regime that is not so hateful of its own people, mm -hmm. that has zero empathy for mm -hmm. uh, its own people. You know, a regime that cares, a regime that can bring some economic stability, some political uh, democracy, and for people to be able to achieve their dreams, uh, find the job they want, send their kids to school, uh, go to universities, um, so, you know, a, a normal life, one of the slogans is we fight for a normal life. So whatever that definition of normal life is, it does not exist in Iran. Hmm. So that's what I want for Iran. I want the leaders of this movement are Iranians inside Iran. Mm -hmm. And so we are followers and I will follow 
their lead, what they want us to do as diaspora in Iranian diaspora anywhere in the world, which is let's do all that we can so that their voices are heard and never uh, never shut down. That's uh, that's what I can do. I wish I could do more, but I have to be realistic, and that's all I can do for now. Mm. And people like yourself that are standing in solidarity and your beautiful wife and my beloved uh, beloved husband, people that have platforms and um, constantly talking about the atrocities as you talk about atrocities around the world. Uh, I think that's probably something that Iranian people would appreciate a lot. Mm -hmm. I sometimes feel like we've lost our way as humanity, you know, is is if we could all just see beyond um, our greed and and just realize that our safety as individuals depends on the safety of everybody, Absolutely. on the well-being of everybody. You know, here we see it mm -hmm. here in Mexico where, um, you know, the minority have a lot of money and, and they think that cutting a few pesos to their workers are going to make them you know, just whatever, instead of realizing, hey, when they are happy and they can live a better life, mm -hmm. you're going to be safer. You know, you are going to be safer. And That's they great. don't see that. It's like, let's build bigger, safer walls around our houses, you know, where that is yeah. not going to be the answer until we see everybody as equally human, you know, That's men, women, children, you know, children. We don't talk about children, but they don't have the voices that women have, for example, to raise those voices themselves. And here, Mexico is the uh, country with number one um, abuse toward children. Right. No, mm. oh, absolutely. And so, uh, you know, it's just how can we all, as humanity, raise ourselves together? Absolutely. 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 And we are fighting for our children, your children, mm. all the children of the world. They are the future. Mm -hmm. We have to keep in mind, though, that, you know, 80 years ago, humanity was, you know, committing massive war centered crimes. 175 million people killed within three and a half years. You know, that's, that's the underside of who we are as hum human beings. You all represent the sunny side of who we are as human beings. The mm -hmm. call for the justice, the love, the fairness, the empathy, the sweetness, the kindness, the generosity. And that latter has always been an uphill battle against the grain. And those who call for it can easily be pushed to the margins, crucified, assassinated, misunderstood, misconstrued. But we say that's our cloud of witnesses. That's our legacy. That's our tradition. We'll never forget it. We pass it on to our precious children. Yeah. Um, I was talking to my cousin the other day and she said, anybody, any voice is appreciated, whatever they do. Um, so I would say the best is to use your wonderful platform and to speak uh you know to speak up and raise awareness mm. that's my suggestion beautiful well i want to thank you so much mm. both of you for the gift of your time um Anahita, now that you're in my world as as cornell will tell you you can't beat me <laughs> off with a stick so <laughs> oh, okay. it's a pleasure it's a pleasure mm. to know you to know uh, your beautiful wife, Sissy. I hope I'm saying your name Sissy. correct. Yes, you are. Yeah. Yeah. Sister Sissy. Yeah. Sister Sissy. Yeah. Well, we're sending you loads of love, and um, ho hopefully, this will help further get out the word and that we, we simply can't turn a blind eye to Iran and just focus on the US. They're connected. Our, our, our steps backward in the dark ages here are intimately connected in their way with what's happening. These pernicious patterns of degradation, humiliation they are, are connected. And so hopefully this will make people step up. Absolutely. Yeah, as uh, um, an Iranian uh, ancient poet says that we're all from the same uh, 
same race. And if one is in pain, the others will be in pain gradually. Many other ones are yek digan, kedar offer in mischief, or haran. The yek or haran chose to be with our daughter at least a guard, the girl was for a naman at her. That's a really famous. Um, um, and feel it. <laughs> That's true. That, that Farsi has a powerful melody to it, doesn't it? Yeah. So yes, it's it's important to have information and you know, uh, right information about people and nations. That there's nothing wrong with Iranians or Arabs. They're both human being from humanity. But um, yes, Iranians speak Farsi. Uh, it's it's a country that actually. Um, you know, has thousands of years of history, but because of the um, influences of Arabs and Islam uh, 1400 years ago, obviously there has been a mixture of language. We do have the golden ages of Islam that a lot of our poets have written poetry, even though in Farsi, there's mixed uh, words of uh, Arabic words. But as you said, it's good to be, um, you know, to be correct that Iranian people are Persians and Iranians, and they speak Farsi. Yes. Well, we send you lots of love, and we look forward to the next time. Thank you so much. Love you, love you, love Thank you. you so much. Love you too. Love back to you. Thank Absolutely. you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lani. Lots of love. <laughs> yes, and lots of love to you. It's what the world needs now, man. Take that care. That is so true. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Thank Bye -bye. you. <laughs>